Welcome to another episode of Dojo Live. My name is Kim Lantis, and it is my pleasure to be hosting today this July 19th, first show of the week. Helping me host is America Guerrero. Hey, hey everybody. America. Hey, Good Peter. Good to see you again. Yes, and the guest of today's show, thank you very much, is Peter Sinclair, the CEO of of beat bread peter i know you've had a long night you've been traveling your traveling is not over currently in connecticut thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us today well thanks for having me guys i really appreciate it no our pleasure we really look forward to learning from you and learning more about beat bread as well before we get into beat bread and the topic of today's show we'd love to get to know you a bit better if you could please tell us kind of your background who you are what your passions are and sort of how this led up to where you are today. Thank sure. you. Sure. Well, I was born in Vermont in the woods, um, which is why I'm in Connecticut. I'm headed home right now to see my family. Um, and I ended up going to California uh, to follow a girl uh, who's now my wife and the mother of my children. And I never thought in a million years that I would ever work in entertainment. Um, I always thought I would work in startups. And I did that for quite some time. Um, but life threw me a curveball, and I ended up um, taking a break from startups and going to work in the uh, entertainment industry. And that's where I saw some things that led to what I'm doing today. So, um, uh, small town. I'm kid. sensing. I'm sensing a mashup here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so, small town kid um, at, who uh, found himself in LA, and um, sort of life happens. And you never know what's going to happen and throw your way and. You have bad luck and good luck, and sometimes there's a bit of good luck wrapped up in the bad luck. And um, and uh, I'll just leave it at that. We can we can you can ask more questions, but uh, um, that's that's where I'm from and 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 how I got here. All right, I love it. Uh, following a girl always makes a great story. I I myself wound up here in Hermosillo, Mexico, by following a boy. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I hear you. We can make a movie out of that. You know, you're that's in right. the right light area. Anyway. <laughs> Right. Perfect. So let's talk about Beat Bread. I'm sensing a mashup somewhere between entertainment and startups. So who are you? What was the genesis of this company? What's the problem you're solving? Yeah. So Beat Bread is a funding platform for independent musicians and independent artists. And uh, ever since the explosion of streaming, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, um, there has also been an explosion of independent labels and independent music. The share of total music consumption that is uh, produced by independent artists um, has gone up very radically. Um, a lot is written about that. What's not even written about is how the share of new music, uh, not old music, is really dominated by independent artists. Um, so, you know, everyone reads about Taylor Swift and other people who, and, you know, Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, who uh, have stayed independent and uh, Chance the Rapper. Um, the desire for artists to stay independent, both to control their careers, but also to own their music and get more of the economics is up and down and across genres. And mm -hmm. we serve that need. Um, we focus on funding and let artists uh, choose uh, the rest of, of their creative and uh, marketing partners. Nice, nice. So it, it's like a Kickstarter for music artists. Could it you is. Say that? So uh, yes and no. So we're not a fan funded platform. Um, okay. Everything we do is based on data science and, and data. So my co-founder, uh, who's not on, John, um, runs actually the biggest group in the company. The most common job title in our company is data scientist. Um, and our every deal that we do is based entirely on data. Um, originally, our data model was built on uh, a data set of 100,000 artists. Uh, almost 6 million tracks and five years of historical data. All those numbers have now more than doubled because we've been in business for two years and we've acquired more and more data. But originally, um, I uh, took out my checkbook and, and bought a very, very large data set from a number of the uh, charting services around the world uh, that allowed us to build that model. That's beautiful. So it's like the best matchmaking possible. Uh, well, we hope so. It, it seems to All be right. doing well. Yeah, we um we're, cool. we do more than we do more than a deal a day. So there seems to be demand for um 
for a product out there. Well, congratulations. I, I look forward to diving deeper into that. And we will get that started specifically with the topic that you chose for today's show. What is that topic, America? Keeping together. How AI and fintech are putting music artists back in the driver's seat. And the question is, why musicians have more choices than ever, thanks yeah. to data and technology, Fundam empowering a fundamental shift in financial creative projects. So please, could you share with us why is it relevant for today's show, please? <laughs> yeah. So artists today have more choice fundamentally because <laughs> fan consumption has changed. Uh, less than a decade ago, um, uh, there's still, you know, certainly 20 years ago, but even less than a decade ago, most music consumption uh, was in physical uh, and downloads. Mm -hmm. And um, if you were an artist, if you wanted to get your music out in the world, you needed to work with a label who had privileged relationships with radio stations, who had the capital to manufacture physical goods. Um, right. And um, you sort of had to go through that system. With streaming, um, radio now is actually follows streaming by about six weeks. What's hot on streaming is what ends up on the radio. Um, so there's not a fixed number of slots anymore to make someone famous. Um, it's sort of like what's happened in television. Um, for those of your listeners who are a bit older, they may remember there used to be only three major uh, networks in, in the United States. Um, ABC, NBC, right. and who right. am I missing? CBS? I yeah. So in 40 <laughs> years, we've gone from three to literally 3,000. Yeah. And the shows that I watch on television and the stars who if I saw on the street, I would be starstruck are different than what you guys would see. And I, I wouldn't even recognize probably, you know, uh, what, what you like and you wouldn't recognize what I would like. That happened in music in about seven years. So... Yeah. The reason that artists have more choice, back to your original question, is streaming has democratized everything. You can get your music out if you're an artist. All of your songs on every major platform, Amazon, Apple, Deezer, Spotify, in every major country in the world for about $20 a year. Um, marketing is now a digital marketing exercise, so it's not a specialized music marketing task. There are plenty of people who've learned their marketing chops, digital marketing across several different sectors. And so artists just have a lot more choice. Um, and we are letting them choose the best partners for them and just focusing on the funding. Exactly, because that makes a really interesting point because I'm thinking about this. A lot of what comes to my mind when I hear streaming is free, 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 mm -hmm. or a whole lot for very little. And so mm -hmm. it comes to this question of how are artists actually able to make a living yeah. in a streaming world? So yeah. where, how, how, how does that happen yeah. and so, what how can we maybe even answer the question of better supporting the artists that yeah. we enjoy well so the first point to make is that artists have never made more money from the recorded music at any point in history than right now and i know that runs counter to what the narrative that you see in the press but if you look at the absolute dollars that are paid out to artists that's higher than any other time uh, in, the, in the history of the music industry. So there's actually a lot of money in streaming. Um, what you read about, however, is that artists don't get their fair share. Um, and there's two things that are going on there. One that I would call legitimate and one that I would call illegitimate. It's too hard a world, but I'll explain that in a second. So the legitimate part of that gripe is that um, artists may be getting um, only five or six cents of the money that's collected in our deal because they've signed a label deal in the past mm -hmm. and the label keeps all the money. That's not streaming's fault. Now, the okay. labels are very good at getting reporters to write about how someone had, you know, a billion streams on Spotify and only got a check for $1,000. What they conveniently leave out is how much money the label made. So if an artist is independent and owns their music, they're going to get the bulk of that, not the label. So that that's sort of a legitimate gripe. The other gripe, and that's there's been recent movement as recently as two weeks ago, is that the streaming services often don't pay the writers of music the share that they historically have gotten um, uh, when, a, when a song is performed. So those are sort of legitimate complaints, but they're really not the streaming services, mostly streaming services' fault. What I would call the illegitimate complaints 
and once again, that's, I need a better word. That's not totally the right word uh -huh. is that you can, you can find a lot of artists and they're typically artists that were popular in the sixties and seventies. Um, I'm just going to pick on Neil Young and David Crosby because I think they have great music. Um, uh, but they just say that the streaming services are garbage. They don't pay anything. The reality is if we were still in a world where the formats were physical, those guys wouldn't be selling records anyway. So, uh, any, so they, not only they're locked into label deals, um, there's just not demand for their music the way it used to be. And that's not the streaming right. services. Right. The, the other thing is Spotify created a world in which it was very easy. And, and obviously the other streaming services too, but Spotify is the trailblazer here. Um, a creative world where it's very easy for people to get their music out there. And so, because so many more artists are creating music, there are now about eight or 9 million artists with significant catalog on Spotify. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of artists out there who aren't getting paid just because they don't have fans. And it's, Spotify has made it possible for more than 10 times as many musicians to make 50, 60, $100,000 a year on the recorded music than ever before. And this is well documented. Mm -hmm. But because there are millions of artists who don't make a lot of money, it's very easy to write a story if you're a journalist talking about how bad Spotify is. Right. right? And so the analogy- So in the big make, picture, it's a really positive thing, right? Yes. In terms of what has happened over the course of history, but then it's easy to get lost in, in numbers. Right. Yeah, I mean, the analogy I would make is if if someone went around and built um, basketball courts all around the United States where they didn't exist before, um, and then a bunch of people started playing basketball, and then everyone who played in their local playground complained that they didn't make an NBA salary, that's sort of what's happening in music. Um, okay. And that's really harsh because music is really hard. It's always been hard. Uh -huh. And it, I don't want to dump on a struggling musician because it's really hard but it's not Spotify's fault. Yeah, and in some ways, what I'm hearing is, I mean, okay, $50,000, $60,000 a year, $100,000 a year, it's not Taylor Swift's income, but it's a it's a decent income. You know, like you, depending on where you are in, in the world, you can live off of that. So if you're talking about, you know, a, a country, let's do, we'll pick on country music, country music artists in the Midwest who's, you know, this freedom to continuously create and make a, a dignified living yeah. from my, you know, bedroom or whatever versus having to go every Friday night, every Saturday night every, to these gigs at these small town bars or whatever that might be to, to sure. kind of hope and scrape by. I mean, in some ways it's, it's really, really positive. Am I on track there? Yeah. I mean, listen, listen, it's always been very hard to make a living as an artist and it's particularly hard, I would argue, to make living as a musician. And so I don't want to belittle that fact because I, that's not my career. Um, uh, and do I think that the streaming services should raise their subscription prices so that artists get paid more? Absolutely, I do. Do I think artists should make more? Absolutely, I do. I'm just not sure that it's the, that's the, the easy story that journalists write that it's Apple and Spotify's fault. Um, mm -hmm anything they've made it better for musicians not worse um, yeah <laughs> what kind um, of music do you fund is um, there a we'll fund musician anything. that you focus on okay yeah so we will fund anything so um we um i would only be exaggerating a little bit if i told you that we never even listen to the music um in other words everything we do is based on data um so we'll we'll do norwegian death metal We'll do hip hop, we'll do Afro beats, um, we'll do um, baby lullaby music. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll do lots. Most of what we do is pop and hip hop, um, just, just because um, that's where, where a lot of consumption is. Um, but we'll do anything. And um, what I like to tell artists is we don't care what your music sounds like and then you should think that's a good thing. Because if, if you have someone who's funding you, who all of a sudden starts making creative judgments, and then they're going to start, because they have money invested, you start trying to control creative um, uh, choices. We will never, ever do that. Um, so it's sort of a good thing that we don't care uh, how it sounds, and we're only into the data. So, so let's talk about that, because I think in some ways it sounds maybe, what's the word, um, not contradictory, but like 
traditionally, if you're thinking about music and artists and, you know, like freedom and like, woo. And then now we want to box it into something that's so square as in data. So it seems mm -hmm. like those two things don't live together, right? But right. how have you figured this out? Exactly how is data and technology and specifically you're talking about AI, yeah. right? F fit into this? Like what, yeah. how does it work? So there's two, two, two parts of what we do. One is AI and one is machine learning. Um, and business, which goes into the business process automation of what we do. So the AI, we look at artist genre, uh, artist fans. Um, we look at stream counts. We look at the growth and degradation of those things. We scrape the web for uh, press mentions for certain publications. Um, uh, we look at social metrics. All of those things give us a sense, not only on an artist level, even on track by track level within an artist catalog, um, and also even their unreleased music. If they release 10 new songs, what are they likely to do? Um, it gives us a sense of, of, of what they're doing. And so um, uh, uh, my co-founder is a data scientist. So I'm going to be very careful about not going too far in describing how it works. Um, but um, we have literally hundreds of thousands of data points for reference. Um, that we're comparing any given artist's um, uh, advance on. And that allows us to not only make predictions, but also allow the artist to choose a one-year only deal where we don't touch any of their new music, or they can choose an eight-year deal where we're going to fund 10 new songs um, and a whole bunch in between. Um, so the more data we look at, the more we can make judgments um, uh, just, just based on the data, rather than guessing based on subjective um, uh, criteria, which, by the way, is not invalid, right? Um, there are people who can go into a nightclub and hear someone who may have no fans today and say that's a star. And I totally respect that. I just know that I'm not that person. Um, uh -huh. And I also know that there aren't enough people out there to listen and discover the thousands of artists who can now make uh, uh, um, a living on their art. Um, you know, there are a very small number of people who can sort of hear that. Um, and, and that's sort of a star driven model where a superstar driven model where they're looking for the, you know, once every five year talent. And, um, you know, as I said, I signed four deals this morning. So, um, we funded four new artists today. So that's, you know, the benefit of what we do, but certainly there are limits to it too. Of course. So it's like, you're able to sort of hack the system, let's say, and look at what's trending in the universe, what's trending with this individual, their creation, and make a, let's say, safe bet. Mm -hmm. Nice. And yeah, then how do you... It, Go ahead. It's, it's safe in the sense that um, uh, our overall performance for our investors is strong. Um, but let's not be mistaken, um, not every deal, you know, is a huge return for us, right? Um, we try, we, you know, there are some where we get it wrong. Um, and, you know, uh, it's not like we're taking, you know, 80% uh, of, the, of the money from an artist the way that a, a record label would for someone who did well. So, yeah. Right. And I guess that's the beauty of the machine learning component. When you do get yeah. it wrong, you're able to learn from it and then get even better. In yeah. The other part of machine learning is that we, um, once we get to the point of doing a deal with an artist, we, we get a lot of their um, actual revenue reports from the distributor. And a label or another funder of music would traditionally have a team of finance people who would pour through reams and reams of, of statements. Um, it takes a very long time. Um, and it you need to pay relatively skilled people a lot of money to do that, which means that deals are slow. And you most companies can't justify an advance of less than $150,000 to an artist. So that shuts out a huge number of artists who may just need $5,000, $10,000, $20,000 to move to Nashville to um, just pay that new producer to shoot that music video. So the machine learning part of what we're doing allows us to do deals very efficiently um, uh, and that sort of expands the pool of artists who can qualify for, for funding. Right, which is beautiful because I, I see this as like the next step or another layer and what streaming has already done to help democratize industry. Yeah. And now you're helping make 
make that funding available and even making it more more free not free in the sense of without cost but free in the sense of democratized <laughs> yeah. cool. I, um, you it yeah. looks like we've, we've got a question sure okay. this is this question is from tony osuna he's one of our fans so he says hello kudos to beat bread marketing team the show started and I scrolled through your website. A minute ago, I was going through Instagram stories and there Beatbread was, haha. It's a comment that he wanted yes. to share. And sure. I have a question. We're not, we're, we're not above uh, a remarketing. So there you go. <laughs> I have a question. Um, what happened? I can just stop thinking about this Mexican music band here. Um, they are kind of aggressive. They have like big powerful words on their songs, the kind of messaging, it could be like, I don't know if it has like a negative impact, but it's, mm -hmm. you said that there is the negative impact. For you as a company, when you're finding artists, is there like a limitation? Is there something that even if they are really a good band and sure. the data is saying like, hey, go for it. Is there a limitation that you said, mm, maybe is there a responsibility? Sure. Or values uh, that you fit into, nice. Yeah, I would argue that there is. Um, and, you know, whenever you are funding art, you need to be very careful about um, making your own judgment and saying that something is not worthy because it happens to offend you, right? There's a lot of great out there that offends people. Um, this is a debate that I have with our head of artist relations all the time. Um, I am not a absolutist on that point, however. Um, I am unable to articulate where I think that line is, um, but I can certainly think of examples of things that we would not fund um, if they were more than merely offensive. Uh, let's put it that way. Right, right. Yeah. Are you able to use, you know, like your, your data science, your technology to help distinguish that? Does it raise certain flags for you that then you're then able to like, you know, not no longer rely on, you know, a, sure. a code or a machine sure. to make your decision for you, but where it's like, okay, you, you want people to look at this. Yeah. So the short answer is that's something we're working on. We do. When I said I was only a little bit hyperbolic saying we didn't listen to music, machines do listen to the music and we actually do it primarily to listen for copyright infringement. Um, those same machines could theoretically look for red flags. Um, we're honestly not there yet. We do rely a lot on the Apples and Amazons and Spotify's themselves, their own content screens. I can tell you that we have funded artists and then um, uh, been fully cooperative with Spotify in taking that music down and taking a loss and willingly taking a loss because the music was... Um, over the line. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. So um, we're a new company. Um, I think certainly that's something that we could add to the mix. Um, that said, we're not the only person policing the store. Of course, of course. So I think we've we've leaned really heavily into the topic of you know a fundamental shift in in the financing of these creative projects. But before you know, we've got about seven eight minutes left in our show, and I'd like to get back to the idea of artists in the driver's seat. So sure. what are the benefits to those, what do you call them, clients, partners, users? Um, who, who are you? Who are your artists? And, and let's talk a little bit to, to why they'd be interested in something like Beat Bread. Yeah. So, you know, we, I get this question from investors a lot. And the answer is there are different segments of artists, right? We have artists um, just from a size perspective. You can look at a couple different variables, but from a size perspective, we'll do advances for as small as a thousand dollars, and that could be, you know, a hobbyist um, or or someone who this is their career and they're trying to make a go of it. Um, and they could be across many genres, and they just need that thousand dollars to, um, you know, buy the next set of beats from a producer so that they can put something out. Um, we've also, on the higher end, we financed someone who had a uh, named Ellie Duhay, who had a global top 10 hit, and we helped her get out of her major reg, uh, record label contract um, with our financing. Um, we also, you know, we funded um, Grammy-nominated 
artists. We've funded people who've won, you know, best new artist awards from uh, uh, BET. Um, we funded folks in Africa, Latin America. Um, so it's across the board. In terms of the uses of capital, um, I would say there's a couple things to think about. The most common use case that artists use our music for is to either make or market music. So it usually, even if they're, they're not um, taking an advance on any new music they create, they're just using in a catalog, we'll do both, which is, is unlike a lot of people, we'll also fund new music too. Um, uh, it's, it's to pay a producer or to, or to shoot a music video. Um, we have funded artists. Um, there's an artist named High On You um, who lived in Montana, um, who used our advance to move to Nashville. Um, because he thought that that would uh, advance his career. Um, there is a uh, sort of Tex-Mex country band, uh, country rock band called Giovanni and, um, uh, what is Giovanni and the, oh my God, guys, I, sorry, I, I uh, took the red eye last night. Anyway, um, okay. I'll, 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 anyway, Giovanni took um, our advance because he had a very, a major label deal on the table and he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. So he took a one year advance from us and used that money to market himself and his fan base doubled in a year. And he is now taking a major label deal for a lot more money, which we think is great. Nice. Right. Nice. Um, uh -huh. uh, and, and we've had a lot in between. So um, yeah, that's sort of, that's what we do. So really it's not like anti label deals, but it's like allowing making it possible for artists to have that ability of choice, timing, yeah, it, it, weight, it, it, to get well-placed. So, so listen, I don't think that it, labels are useless and I don't think labels are going away. Um, I do think that there are some artists who should never do a label deal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that I wouldn't have said that um, all but for a very edge case, 10 years ago, you really needed a label 10 years ago. You don't need a label anymore. There's some artists where it's beneficial. Um, so we provide artists choice and it's either to lever into a better label deal in the future or to stay independent entirely. And in some edge cases, we actually help people get out of a label deal. Labels fundamentally are sources of capital for artists and they're promotion engines. The problem in the industry is that artists have had to have the two married together and they often are getting very bad economic terms historically in order to get that promotion. Mm -hmm. But because they can get promotion elsewhere now, labels sh shouldn't be able to put such bad terms in front of them. And ultimately, I think that you're going to see labels compete on the, their ability to help artists create better music and artists to market music better. And there's some super Thanks. talented people at the labels. Um, uh, so it's not that they're going away. It's just that they, they aren't going to be able to just sit on the on the on on the fact that they have a big checkbook because other people can provide financing for artists and give them choice. Nice. Is some of this technology that you're building out going to be able to better guide artists as well? I mean, I think right now it's the financing side of you know who 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 should we be financing and kind of why. But once you've made that commitment. Are you able then to analyze where you should be headed or yeah. to advise counsel? What you're describing is a very hard problem, but it is not something that we don't aspire to do. Um, okay. Right now we're funding artists. Um, we have a lot of growth still to do in the sort of this basic level of what we're doing, but we have aspirations to use our data to help artists find the best partners possible. And there are marketing partners, there are production partners, um, there are a whole bunch of other uh, other partners. So um, we will not be doing that this year, um, but it's certainly within the purview of our vision for the company. Very cool. The, it's just amazing that tech is limitless and I, it's just yeah. awesome. Now we are we really kind of at our last minute of the show and I would like to ask you about the name Beat Bread. Now, I think sure. beat music, that makes sense. Bread, what's coming to my mind is just sort of this daily bread, the basics of making a living. Am I, am I off base or on base with that? Yeah, no, it's very, it's very simple. It, uh, it's, it's beat music and bread like money. Um, beat bread. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Uh, down I'm not right. that cool. I missed it. Right. Um, <laughs> um, and then, but, but the third point that's important is that the URL was cheap. So, um, <laughs> so, you know, there are, you know, there are, there are alliterative versions where dough or cash right. or um, I learned a lot of um, euphemisms for 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 money. For money. Um, okay. Shekel, dough Wanda, I'm familiar with. Bread I hadn't heard that. yet. I'm not that hip. Right. Right. <laughs> we could have been called song stacks as an example. Um, or um, or uh, I can't remember what I had with dough. But anyway, I literally, you know, at one in the morning was going through all the different variations of names that with um, euphemisms for money. Um, and it was really about the URLs that that I could buy for for, you know, less than twenty dollars as opposed to several thousand dollars. It's amazing how, how many great names have just been bought by Internet squatters. So, oh, well, you did great. I love it. Beat Bread yeah. is super catchy. Uh where are you at? I know you said that you're a young company. Let's just real quick talk about your company culture. What are you sure. looking to build? Where are you headed? And and how have you, you know, kind of kept up with that or helped mold it, um, you know, meet it <laughs> yeah. into what you want it to be? Yeah. So I think, and this is probably a better question for the rest of the company than me, but um, I think that we are structured in the way we approach our work, but we're pretty informal. We're somewhat, we're non-hierarchical. Um, I, th um, I think you'd find if you talk to the team, um, we very much value dissent, um, mm -hmm. and people who disagree, um, to get, you know, it's not about winning an argument. It's about getting to the right answer. Um, and neither myself nor my co-founder are always right by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and so we, we, we definitely welcome that. Um, and then I, you know, I heard a podcast recently, um, with a founder was talking about things that he focuses on. I can't remember who it was, but I thought it was very smart and, and, and I think, um, it fit for me. And, and his, he had three tests for what you should work on in a company. Okay. And it was um, hard, valuable, and fun. So if it's not fun, why do it? Um, if it's valuable, um, in other words, the product you create, people can use it. Um, if it's not valuable, why do it? If it's valuable, mm -hmm. but it's not hard, then a million other people will do it too. Right? right. If it's hard, but it's not valuable, then you're just you know, that's just something for sort of, you know, a puzzle for puzzle's sake, right? right? And so I think that we're attacking something that's very hard. Um, I think it's definitely valuable and we do our best to have fun with it. Nice. I love it. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your insight today, Peter, your words of wisdom. We wish you and Beat Bread nothing but success as you move forward. So thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. And I really, I really appreciate the time. And thanks to, uh, to those of you out there who, um, have taken the time to, to listen to, to yeah. us for a second. And if you're an aspiring artist or an established artist, doesn't matter, check out Beat Bread. Perfect. Hang on just one minute before we go off air. America, what do we got coming up tomorrow and Thursday? Yeah, so tomorrow we're going to have an interview with Sophie Rothor. She is the CEO and co-founder at Symbol AI. And we're going to talk about the intersection of machine learning and human conversations. How can businesses take advantage of the conversation data generated every day to unlock the next stage of growth? It's going to be tomorrow at 12 p.m. Pacific. Perfect. Well, we'll see you. We'll see you then. Thank you again, everyone. And until tomorrow, stay safe. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.